it's absolutely clear from the study in terms of the cost benefit analysis that if you went for the cheaper option today, yeah. then that mm -hmm. option is not cheap because you would have to be repeating <laughs> right. the costs. But if you went for the a bit more expensive option, but more effective, then your benefit cost ratio is greater than one and it will persist. It's a choice we've got to make. You save today, but you do not save tomorrow. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. Multifaceted graduation programs have shown potential to permanently change the lives of desperately poor people in many locations. This evidence has encouraged other governments to consider implementing similar programs, but which components of these programs are the most important? And would any of these single interventions work just as well if they were tried on their own? Robert Osei of the University of Ghana, he's also recently joined the editorial board of Voxdev, is part of a team that has tested the elements of the graduation program in Ghana, and he joins me now. Robert, welcome to Voxdev Talks. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Bring us up to date on the theory behind these interventions. Who is graduating? What are they graduating from? I think that for the number of poor people in the world today, plus the number of programs that have been undertaken in the developing world and the amount of money that has been poured into development and to fight poverty. The numbers that we have today are certainly not acceptable. And so these piecemeal programs may not be as efficacious as they should be. And it is why there is discussion on moving towards a livelihoods approach which looks at the constraints to poverty in a holistic manner. So you are not just doing cash transfers as is being done in many parts of the world today, but you are looking at livelihoods. Whilst cash transfers may be smoothing consumption, it is important to think beyond consumption. Poor households also want to be able to generate their own incomes. It's about how we get the poor to shift from their current position. And their current position is one which is insecure, their income sources are fragile, to one where income generating activities then become a part of their livelihoods. So it is the extremely poor households who hopefully can graduate out of poverty. Tell me a little bit about the day-to-day -day life of the people at whom these programs are aimed, the people who are the poorest of the poor, aren't they? Absolutely. The poorest of the poor. If you take a country like Ghana, um, the per capita consumption is on an annual basis just around a little over $50. Most of them are employed in the agri sector. Um, on average, within these parts of the country, um, the average age is under 30 years. You have over 70% of these people actually practicing opium defecation. Nutritional outcomes are problematic. So in northern Ghana, for instance, over 31% are stunted. About a fifth are wasted and also um, about a fourth are underweight. And these are all indicators of development which are problematic. If there is a change in input prices, if there is a change in output prices, or if there is drought, these households have no resilience. It's a very precarious situation that we find the world's poor in currently. On Vox Talks, we cover many interventions to help the world's poor, or single interventions, things like microcredit or asset transfers. Are these interventions not working on their own, which is why you are combining many of them in the graduation program? A very important point, and it goes to why we, we think this particular uh, research is important. Development is not meant to work in a piecemeal way. If you take microcredits, which is meant for a business venture, for many reasons, the 
outcome of why you took that microcredit may not be achieved. If there is an adverse shock what it, uh, to the household, which may not be related to the business, but what it will mean is that for these households, that microcredit will end up being used for something else other than the investment. Ultimately, the returns to that investment is either lost or is significantly reduced. So these single interventions, like I said, becomes very difficult to use as a tool to move poor households out of poverty. But I think these graduation programs, they consider to be relatively expensive. They must also be quite hard to organize if you're delivering more than one intervention at one time. Is that the case? Absolutely. By their very nature, it's multifaceted. And because it's multifaceted, it comes as a package. But one has to be careful not to take a narrow view of the development goal. Many governments in the developing world, they are actually undertaking most of these projects anyway. They are undertaking some form of training with the aim of impacting on poor people. They are undertaking all sorts of things to try and then improve savings for poor households. Many governments today are also doing cash transfers. So the bigger challenge is not that the multifaceted programs are expensive because already they are being undertaken. So the bigger challenge is how you can coordinate these elements they together can impact positively on welfare outcomes of extremely poor households. Nevertheless, I would imagine that uh, anyone who's funding these programs and governments, they will always be getting back to you and saying, listen, you've got good results for all of this. Could we do it just a little bit cheaper if we did less, if instead of delivering four interventions, we delivered the three that work best? Is that what happens? Absolutely, Tim. When we finished the initial SUS country study and following uh, presentations to policymakers here in Ghana, there was a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. We met the minister and we told them about how if you have a multifaceted because of how complicated development is and because poverty does not just have one binding constraint, if you were to implement something like this, it could actually boost A, the sort of fight against poverty, but also achieve quite sustained outcomes. However, when discussions around the cost began, um, of course, this old minister says, okay, now if I'm to do this graduation program, which is costing around $300, and uh, it costs me just, say, $50 to buy a goat, why wouldn't I use that money to buy only goats for the households? It was the complications associated with development and the fact that there are opportunity costs associated with policies that we pursue. But I think that the right question to ask is what the benefits are relative to the costs. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, and we also understand that we have a lot of individual programs that are running already, if we can coordinate these programs properly, then we can together be working towards achieving sustained poverty reduction. So let's look at this Ghana program, Robert. What did it set out to deliver? In the original program, it had six components. First component being a consumption support a uh, weekly cash stipend for consumption support between six to nine dollars PPP. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for the entire duration of the lean season and extended to about 14 months. Then also we had a savings component, opening the savings account for these poor households, plus improving the access to the financial services by making the field agents visit households on a weekly basis so that they could take savings away from the households, bringing the financial services to um, the poor households. Then there was a third component, which was uh, productive assets. And for that, we gave the households a choice of number of assets, goats, hands, pigs, 
inputs, paddy rice inputs, sorghum, and then household decided which ones they wanted. Then uh, we had a fourth component, which was skills training. The idea was that whatever assets we were going to give to the households, they needed to be able to manage the assets in a way that made productive sense. We got field agents to deliver training over the duration of the program. Then we also had a basic health education, particularly in sanitation and nutrition. If household health is secured, then the likelihood uh, of their productivity dropping is lower, but also the likelihood of using their savings to take care of their health is also reduced. And then we had regular visits providing life coaching, the encouragement to keep going. And did you get positive results for this? And, and were they long lasting, I guess, as well? Did the households manage to graduate out of poverty? Absolutely. The programs were implemented over a one year period. And then we tested for key outcome indicators in year two. And we stopped all the activities after year two. And then one year after, we tested again the positive effects that we anticipate based on the program. Our results amazingly showed a very positive consumption effects and persistent consumption effects. Same for assets as well. Savings was also positive. We also found, interestingly, that social inclusion was also positive. Although, in the case of Ghana, it was not persistent after year three. And same for the activity of daily uh, living or the health outcomes. So generally, I think that the results were very, very positive. This multifaceted program does impact positively, not just on current consumption, but way after you actually finish the program, these effects will still persist, which will then suggest that that program can lead to graduation out of poverty which is what the development objective is. But I guess, as we've already discussed, there must be some people who are thinking, maybe one of the elements might deliver something comparable if we just tried it on its own. I, I know that you then went back and tried two of the individual facets of this intervention on their own. Which were they? The assets and then the savings. But you're absolutely right. I mean... The fact that we find positive and persistent poverty effects didn't necessarily mean that all the components were necessary. So when you used the savings only part of the program, what was the intervention there? Similar to the GUP, giving households, these poor households, a savings account and improving access to the bank by getting agents to collect savings on their behalf to the bank. And there was also the asset transfer arm just tried on its own. Uh, and what happened in that situation? We are mm -hmm. stuck with the goods, which was consistent with what most mm -hmm. of the households had chosen in the initial study. Okay, I think about over 70% of the households are chosen goods. And so we included four goods, which are the assets for the household experiment. But of course, the goods also had some positive traits, which made it a good asset to use for this particular experiment. Most of these households have experience with goods, and so the chances of succeeding then is significantly higher, even with little training. So you have something that's pretty comparable to what you were doing in this multifaceted program, haven't you? Because you've just taken two of those individual facets, delivered them in the same way as when they were delivered in the graduation program. Do you get anything like the results that you got from the graduation program? And, and do you get any lasting results? If you take just the savings and just the assets, mm -hmm. no, um, you do not get the lasting results. You do get positive effects, but the positive effects of the individual components are much lower. While the GUP boosted incomes, the savings also boosted incomes and boosted savings. But the savings effects of the GUP program was significantly higher than the savings effects of the savings program. And so because the whole point of this program was to lift people permanently out of poverty so that not just 
them, but their families, their children, would also be lifted out of poverty, then delivering these single arms isn't doing that at all, is it? It, it? It's working for a little while, but it's not producing the effect. That's the whole point of this graduation program. Absolutely. Absolutely. If it's about your objective, ultimately, which is moving people out of poverty, you must be concerned about the size mm-hmm. of the effects and persistence. Yeah. Both instances where we undertake the individual components, they are not comparable to when we do the multifaceted program. The multifaceted programs are positive and long lasting. We cannot say which components are driving the outcomes mm-hmm. because it could be just encouragement effect. And so we will not make the claim that we understand which components work and which components do not work. However, we are now able to say something about whether having a multifaceted program is not only sufficient, but it's also necessary. Can we say something perhaps about why these individual elements of the program are not working, are not producing the lasting results? For example, when you provide the access to the savings on its own, do we know the mechanism which means that there is not persistence? We understand a bit of it, but we do not understand it all. So for instance, if you do take just the savings only, shocks could impact how you translate savings into positive investment returns. Mm -hmm. So I have savings of $50. If I'm hit by a shock, that savings could significantly reduce. Also, the capabilities of the individuals in how you use the savings to invest and therefore engender returns could be very different, right? So when you understand how to undertake production, your returns are likely to be higher. Perhaps what this is saying is that people need earnings to save. You don't need savings to earn. But also the coaching and handholding, I think it's critical uh, to ensure that you are able to turn savings into investment. The non-poor, the middle Mm -hmm. income of the world today, need coaching. They need handholding to invest. Of course, the dimensions will not be always the same, but investment advice is essentially coaching on how to invest appropriately. It could be a number of reasons why the savings only does not work, but the GUP provides elements that will minimize how the absence of these effects will impact negatively on the returns to savings. And do you think it's similar for the group that received the asset transfer, the goats? Because if you don't think about it very much, you think, well, they've got goats, so then they've can, then they got earnings, then they can save, problem solved, but clearly not that simple. Absolutely. Capabilities to keep goats as a productive assets. We take these things for granted, but clearly they are not. Shocks could also affect it. If you only have goats and then there is a shock, the goats fall ill. And if you do not have any savings to then bring in a bed or replace your stock, clearly what it will mean is that ultimately medium to long term, your wealth will begin to decline. But also, I think that the encouragement, I think we don't emphasize that enough. Uh, Encouragement, I think, is quite an important component. In today's world where penetration of mobile phones enables us to do this in a very cost-effective way. This is one area that we need to also emphasize quite a bit. Now, if I'm from the government, though, Robert, I'm going to still come back to you and I'm going to say, I know it's not working as well. We never expected it to work as well. But you know what? It's so much cheaper. And if we are going to be delivering this to thousands of people who are in need of it, can we still say that maybe those single interventions have a better benefit compared to cost? Can you make that argument at all? It's absolutely clear from the study in terms of the cost-benefit analysis that if you went for the cheaper option today, then that Mm -hmm. option is not cheap because you would have to be repeating (laughs) the costs. But if you went for the a bit more expensive option, but more effective, 
then your benefit cost ratio is greater than one and it will persist. It's a choice we got to make. You save today, but you do not save tomorrow. So it's a delicate choice, but I think that if we understand the evidence of the two options that we have, then it makes the choice a bit more easier for the policymaker. Yeah, I, I, we don't usually cover research that doesn't seem to have solved a problem on uh, VoxDev Talks, but this has a, a positive message, doesn't it? It reinforces our commitment to invest in these multifaceted programs in the future because they do seem to be delivering long-lasting results. Totally. And remember that the multifaceted program is sufficient for generating Mm -hmm. sustainable impacts. In the initial study, we were not sure whether it is necessary. Now, taking two components, we can actually say that it is necessary. Mm -hmm. This is, however, not to suggest that we can throw everything into a bundle in the spirit of undertaking a multifaceted program. Of course, from a political economy point of view, that might be cool, right? If I'm a politician, (laughs) then I can say, oh, I'm throwing in these uh, investments because I want multifaceted programs so that the complementarities work. Mm -hmm. What it is saying, I think, clearly, is that we need to use evidence to implement development programs that are multifaceted Mm -hmm. because Unfortunately, for poverty traps, there is not just one binding constraints. So you need to understand which constraints are binding so that you can then work at reducing or removing those constraints. It is only then that you can be sure of sustained and positive impacts on poverty. It's very exciting what we know. It's fascinating what we don't know yet. Congratulations on your research so far, Robert, and good luck for the future. Thank you very much, Tim. If you want to read about the research, the paper is called Unpacking a Multifaceted Program to Build Sustainable Income for the Very Poor. And the list of authors, it's an all-star cast here. Abhijit Banerjee, Dean Carlin, Robert Osei, Hannah Trachtman and Chris Udry. This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to subscribe. You will find us wherever you get your podcasts. And all our episodes, as always, are at voxdev.org, where you will find articles about the papers we feature.